found our way here now. So uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. So um, it's a pleasure today to have uh, Perry Hatchfield give our lunch talk. Uh, um, so Perry is a, a graduate student at the University of Connecticut where he uh, works with Cara Battlesby um, on trying to understand um, essentially how stars form. And he is gonna tell us today about the dynamics uh, and star formation in the Milky Way's Galactic Center. So take it away, Perry. All right, thank you so much. And thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, come and talk here at one of the, the lunch talks. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'm Perry Hatchfield. I'm finishing up a PhD at the University of Connecticut uh, where I've spent my PhD working on studying dynamics and star formation in the Milky Way's Galactic Center using a number of observational approaches as well as computational approaches uh, and hopefully trying to figure out ways to let one inform the other and vice versa. Um, so yeah, Ooh. okay. Uh, from our place in the disk of the Milky Way, we have a really nice view of local sites of star formation. Um, there are plenty of uh, low mass star forming regions and a little bit further off, some nice high mass star forming regions. And uh, by taking careful observations and studying these regions, we've developed very nice theories of star formation that help us understand why stars form, where they form, uh, and you know, how many of what types of stars form in these environments. Um, however, if we want to try to understand star formation in unresolved populations, such as in the distant universe or you know, just in, in parts of the galaxy that are a little further away, um, we need to really make sure that the assumptions that we make aren't biased on the local set of um, parameters that sort of influence star formation in the, the local part of the Milky Way. Uh, since if we based all of our theories of star formation off of uh, these nearby regions, if star formation happens to operate differently in different environments that we can't study so easily, um, such as in high redshift galaxies, uh, suddenly our, our interpretations of those unresolved populations might be biased. And this has some pretty wide implications for how we understand star formation in the cosmos as a whole. So the obvious choice is to try to study star formation in nearby galaxies. Um, however, then there are obvious trade-offs in terms of resolution and sensitivity to physical parameter spaces. Um, so a nice middle ground is to study the Milky Way's galactic center. It's sort of the nearest best laboratory for studying star formation in an environment that is sufficiently different from uh, the properties of the uh, local Milky Way disk. So what's going on in the galactic center that makes it so interesting? Well, it's uh, a lot actually. Here is a three color image uh, of the galactic center and uh, a few different far infrared bands. And uh, as you can, without getting into too many of the details of exactly what all of these different wavelengths are tracing, there's a lot going on here. Um, there are uh, young massive protoclusters of stars being born, massive star formation. There are bubbles being blown from feedback um, and supernovae explosions. Uh, there are the densest molecular clouds in the entire galaxy, as well as a supermassive black hole at the very center. Um, so clearly with a lot going on here, uh, we have the opportunity to test a, a lot of uh, different parameter spaces than we necessarily have access to in the disk of the galaxy. Um, so the way that uh, my research has sort of gone about doing this is to approach it from both the observational and the computational side, uh, kind of at the same time and really try to benefit from where the, the two approaches inform each other. So by constructing surveys and building catalogs of star forming regions in the galactic center, um, we can provide observational constraints on the physics of star formation and on the history of the CMZ. Uh, using those constraints, we can then build uh, what we hope to be accurate hydrodynamic simulations of a CMZ-like uh, environment. I apologize, I didn't actually define the um, acronym CMZ here. What I mean by that is the central molecular zone, which is um, this very, very dense ring of gas. I meant to define that on the previous slide, sorry. Um, so the CMZ, this central molecular zone, uh, is this very dense ring of gas, and we are trying to produce what we hope to be realistic simulations of that region. Um, we can then use those simulations to explore um, the time domain evolution of molecular clouds and star formation within this uh, extreme environment, and then use those to inform what sorts of observations we take to further constrain the physics of star formation. Um, so hopefully through this cycle, we continue to build towards a 
uh, self-consistent understanding of star formation as a function of environment. So I'm going to start out mostly talking about the observational side of things after briefly introducing um, the sort of open science questions and interesting phenomena that we observe in the Milky Way's Galactic Center. So the Central Molecular Zone, or CMZ, contains this massive reservoir of gas. Uh, it appears to be orbiting on a somewhat elliptical orbit around the galactic nucleus at a radius of about 100 parsecs. Sometimes it's called the 100 parsec ring, although the exact 3D structure is certainly up for debate. Um, it has a, a lot of molecular gas at very high densities, about 3 to 5 times 10 to the 7 solar masses, uh, contained in these massive dense molecular clouds with typical densities around 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 um, molecules per uh, cubic centimeter. And this, this reservoir actually contains about 80% of the dense molecular gas content of the entire Milky Way. Um, because of its extreme properties, uh, there's a lot of star formation, a lot of dense gas, and large velocity dispersions. It's been suggested that this region could be used as an analog for high redshift environments. Uh, particularly, it could be used uh, to study uh, starburst galaxies at a redshift of about, about two uh, near cosmic dawn. Uh, when most of the stars in the universe were uh, formed. Um, so there's a long laundry list of ways in which the central molecular zone is an extreme environment in terms of Milky Way standards. There's all this high density molecular gas. The gas is kinematically complex and highly turbulent. Uh, high gas temperatures, pressures, complex chemistry, uh, powerful magnetic fields in the sort of milligauss uh, strength range. Uh, intense interstellar radiation, a high cosmic ray ionization rate. It's an overwhelming list of things. Um, so I suggest we just start with the very first one on this list. There's a large quantity of high density molecular gas. Um, and if you study star formation, you might suspect that a large quantity of high density molecular gas would lead to a lot of star formation, a, a, a nuclear starburst in our Milky Way. It's not unreasonable to think that that might be the case. When we look at nearby galaxies that do have nuclear starbursts like NGC 253, we see somewhat similar properties. Uh, NGC 253 has a similar uh, stellar mass, uh, likely a similar black hole mass at the center. Uh, it does have about a factor of 10 more molecular gas within its central molecular zone than our Milky Way does. Um, but its nuclear star formation rate exceeds the star formation rate of the entire Milky Way galaxy combined. Um, and so this study on the right shows some ALMA data uh, from the center of NGC 253 with these massive protoclusters, um, each one of which has a higher star formation rate than uh, our entire central molecular zone. So um, to compare how, what this sort of means in terms of our own central molecular zone, um, I like to play this little game called spot the CMZ. Um, so here there are four horizontal kind of panels uh, stacked vertically on top of each other. And each of them shows a different uh, star formation tracer as a function of galactic longitude on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is galactic latitude, but that doesn't matter so much. Um, the top ones show H2 regions. Uh, below that, there are methanol masers, which are another tracer of star formation. Uh, water masers as well. Um, and then the bottom one shows a uh, H-alpha map as well in contours. Um, so if I told you to look at this and identify the site of a nuclear starburst as a function of you know, galactic longitude, basically point out the galactic center, um, I think anybody would be hard pressed to do that from these data. However, if I then go and add an additional panel that shows the dense gas content as traced by ammonia, um, suddenly it's very clear where the galactic center is. There's this massive overdensity of uh, high density gas, but there isn't really a corresponding increase in the star formation tracer sort of prevalence in that region. Uh, this is a little bit curious. It's not that the CMZ doesn't have star formation, it's just not particularly standing out given this incredible reservoir of dense gas that it has. So this uh, we can put into sort of galactic and extragalactic context a little more quantitatively as well. Um, this figure shows on the x-axis uh, the dense gas uh, content and on the y-axis the um, rate of star formation. And you can see that many 
Milky Way clouds, disk galaxies, and high redshift galaxies lie um, pretty close together in terms of a power law relating their dense gas content to their star formation rates. Uh, the Milky Way lie, or the, the center of the Milky Way actually lies considerably below this. So it seems like the Milky Way's galactic center on average has a star formation rate that is about a factor of 10 to 100 lower than we would expect from these sort of contemporary scaling laws for star formation. Uh, and that's a little bit mysterious. So there are, there are two sort of potential suspects in the case of this low star formation rate. Uh, the first of which is uh, the suppression of star formation efficiency. It's possible that some of the mechanisms in the galactic center are uh, reducing the rate at which stars are able to form from this dense gas. And so even though there is a lot of dense gas, um, the physics of the galactic center prevents it from collapsing and forming stars. Um, the second possibility is that there is a highly time variable star formation rate or an episodic star formation rate within the galactic center. So um, we happen to be looking at these dense molecular clouds now that aren't forming stars, but shortly they will be. Um, and if this is the case, we would expect that in the past, there has been a lot of star formation and in the future, there will be a lot more star formation. And we just happen to be looking at the galactic center at a low point. Um, both of these theories have some compelling evidence to support them as uh, sort of hypotheses for explaining this low star formation rate per dense gas content. Um, some of that work uh, that I've been involved with, um, Matt Orr and I looked at some of the fire galaxy centers uh, last year, and uh, we found that the centers of a lot of fire galaxies seem to fall into sort of two classes. Um, there were some of them that had very sort of smooth star formation rates that remained relatively constant in time. Uh, and there were also a, a class of galaxies, which we were calling uh, asymmetric or star formation galaxies, uh, galaxy centers um, that had highly time variable star formation rates in which you had large inflows and outflows of gas, huge bursts of star formation within sort of the central few hundred parsecs, and then uh, periods of relative quiescence. Um, and when we compare the star formation properties of both of these two classes of galaxies, we found that the only galaxies that were able to um, agree with the dense gas content and star formation rate of the Milky Way were the very asymmetric ones. And the only moments at which they lined up with the Milky Way star formation rate were the moments when there was a huge dip in the star formation rate of the galactic center region. Um, so this is potentially some evidence saying that, okay, maybe the galactic center is very time variable and we're just looking at it at a bad moment. Um, but there's also compelling evidence that the star formation efficiency could be suppressed. Um, and one of the prime candidates for suppressing star formation efficiency in molecular clouds is turbulence. Um, there's been a, a sort of long history of showing that including uh, powerful turbulence within uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulations can suppress the rate at which sink particles form. And so perhaps if you have an environment like the galactic center with very intense turbulence and um, potentially certain types of turbulence over others like solenoidal versus uh, compressively driven turbulence, you could end up reducing the rate of star formation uh, and, and reducing the efficiency of star formation in the galactic center uh, preferentially over other parts of the galaxy. Um, studying turbulence is tricky to do from observations. Um, in particular, the galactic center is pretty far away. Um, so a lot of uh, our typical methods are limited by confusion and by uh, error from the, the methods that we use to observe them. One metric for understanding turbulence in the galactic center is to look at the probability distribution function uh, of the column density of the gas. Uh, and this has been sort of used as a a theoretical and observational metric for constraining um, the, the strength and type of turbulence uh, that occurs within molecular clouds. Um, so I've been working with a undergraduate student at University of Connecticut, Hannah Koschel, um, and we've been working together to uh, try to figure out if we can understand uh, or recover uh, these uh, turbulent probability uh, distribution functions of the column density uh, from interferometric observations. Um, we sort of have a lot of really great interferometric observations from various sources of the galactic center. Uh, and by simulating the process of interferometry on uh, uh, 
turbulent box simulations of molecular clouds and treating them as though they lie at the galactic center. Uh, we've been trying to figure out whether we can recover those PDFs and whether those PDFs can be used to understand the turbulent properties of the clouds that they are uh, taken from, uh, since we do have the ground truth of the simulation runs. Um, and this is still very much work in progress. Hannah is working on writing a paper on this now, so the analysis is kind of um, still occurring. Uh, but preliminary results show that there is a sort of regime of the probability density function that we're able to resolve, um, but that it's probably unreliable at particularly high and particularly low column densities. Um, however, we might be able to constrain some of the turbulent properties of those clouds um, by looking at this regime that is well sort of replicated from interferometric observations. So digging a little bit deeper into this question of why the star formation rate is so low in the galactic center compared to the disk, it seems like um, the, the average star formation rate that it was shown on the dense gas star formation scaling relationship from before um, doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. In fact, um, individual cloud by cloud studies have shown that uh, some clouds in, in the mole central molecular zone have a lot of star formation and uh, line up pretty well with these dense gas star formation relations, uh, and some of them don't. Uh, so if we want to understand better what's actually going on here, um, it seems like what we really need are complete uh, and unbiased surveys of all of the clouds in the central molecular zone to just build a large statistical sample of what's going on and try to get to the bottom of this. Um, so there, there are quite a few molecular clouds in the Galactic Center that have been well studied. Um, in particular, uh, this is a figure uh, from Henshaw et al. 2019 that just nicely labels a lot of the famous clouds and features of the Galactic Center. Um, so this bright point here in the center is Sagittarius A star and sort of the uh, nuclear stellar cluster. Uh, but all the way out here on the edge is uh, the Sagittarius B2 complex, which looks pretty dark in the, these wavelengths, but it's actually um, the most massive molecular cloud in the Milky Way, uh, and also one of the most intense sites of star formation in the Milky Way. Um, so uh, uh, it, it's, it's certainly an interesting candidate to study within this context of where is star formation happening in the Milky Way center and where is it not happening. Um, we also have this particularly famous cloud sort of right in the center here, seen in extinction uh, called G0.253, uh, which is colloquially referred to as the brick. Um, it's called that because it just appears as this kind of block-like uh, feature of uh, extinction and appears to have very little active star formation despite very, very high column densities of gas. So to, to set out to survey all of this, um, I am part of the uh, CM Zoom survey, which is an SMA uh, submillimeter array large program. And we used about 550 hours over four years uh, to survey the entire galactic center, uh, in particular, all of the material in the galactic center that is above a column density of 10 to the 23. So basically, if there's any high column density gas in the galactic center, it was surveyed as a part of this survey. And we were able to resolve the, uh, these clouds to uh, sub parsec resolution to about a, a spatial resolution of 0.1 parsec. And uh, upcoming work, we're also going to release, uh, in addition to the, the dust continuum at 1.3 millimeters, we're also going to release um, a whole bunch of spectral data, including uh, carbon monoxide isotopologues, uh, the loud the ladder of um, formaldehyde hyperfine lines uh, to get temperatures. Uh, and a whole bunch more lines and shock tracers and dense gas tracers. So there's going to be some exciting science coming from that down the road. Um, my particular role in the survey was to develop the continuum catalog. Um, so this is uh, essentially setting out to try to identify all of the sites of potential ongoing or future star for or massive star formation in the Milky Way's galactic center. Um, so because of the sensitivity and scales, uh, scale of this survey, we weren't going to be sensitive to all of the low mass star formation, uh, but we uh, managed to show using some uh, synthetic observation uh, testing uh, for completeness that we are actually complete to all possible high mass star formation in the galactic center. Um, so this survey hopefully will serve as a, a good tool for studying high mass star formation, but also in the future 
um, for sort of uh, narrowing in on possible sites of low mass star formation as well. Um, so the way that this catalog was constructed, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, we, we used a dendrogram-based cataloging algorithm to locate all of these objects. Um, in general, we found that a lot of these objects are sort of intermediate to the physical scales of clumps and cores. Uh, this is a, a mass radius uh, relationship uh, diagram showing uh, all of these uh, CM zoom catalog objects uh, plotted against the mass radius relationship of uh, clumps and cores distributed throughout the disk on the left and the CMZ on the right. Uh, and in general, what we found is that uh, the fragmentation that we do see seems to be pretty accurately in line with a lot of the uh, clumps and cores that we see elsewhere. So it doesn't seem like the actual structures that are fragmenting are particularly abnormal in terms of their uh, their size per sort of, or sorry, their uh, mass per size. Um, this is interesting because it, it seems that the way that cores are fragmenting in the galactic center is the same, uh, but this doesn't necessarily tell us anything yet about where they are forming and perhaps more interesting where they are not forming. Um, so I mentioned Sagittarius B2, uh, which has been kind of an elephant in the room when it comes to the CMZ. Uh, it is sort of unlike anything else that is occurring in the central molecular zone, where uh, you have objects that are just considerably more massive uh, per unit size than anything else in the galaxy. Um, and in physical parameter space, Sagittarius B2 just seems to be fundamentally different. So we have this very, very anomalous burst of star formation uh, that interestingly is occurring sort of at the furthest point from the galactic center. Um, it's lying uh, near what we think to be the apocenter of the orbit. And I'll come back a little bit later in the talk to talk about why the apocenter is perhaps an interesting point to study. Um, we also found that uh, the places where th uh, this substructure was forming tend to be uh, above a certain uh, large scale column density threshold. But so by comparing the, the locations of each of these uh, substructure objects, uh, with the column density of their parent cloud, we find that once you get above a column density of, of about uh, two times 10 to the 23 on the cloud scale, uh, you actually end up almost always having compact substructure. Um, however, below that, and most of the CMZ is below that very high column density, uh, you find that there's actually just not a lot of compact substructure. Um, on average, what we found is that most clouds in the CMZ just haven't really fragmented into compact sources. Um, this is perhaps a sign that some process like intense turbulence is preventing the clouds from collapsing. Um, however, we're not able to necessarily show that quite yet. Uh, so yes, it, it, in terms of the amount of mass contained within the compact substructure, about uh, less than 10% of all of the mass in the CMZ is contained within uh, within those compact substructure uh, sources. Um, so in terms of future work, we're, we're working to characterize which of these uh, compact sources are star forming and which of them are not. And I'm currently working on publishing a paper in which we look at uh, sort of legacy surveys of the Galactic Center from Herschel and Spitzer, as well as looking at uh, star formation tracers like Mazers and trying to figure out which of these sources have signatures of star formation, which of them are quiescent. Uh, so on the left here is shown uh, the brick, that very, very dense low star formation cloud I was talking about before. Uh, and you can see that it, it does actually have these compact substructure formations within it, but none of them appear to have any meaningful star formation signatures. Uh, whereas this cloud over here on the right is part of the dust ridge, a series of star forming clouds in the CMZ. Uh, it appears to have one very large star forming core where we think a, a young massive proto cluster is being born. Um, so we're doing this for essentially the entire central molecular zone. Uh, and the tentative results that we're finding are uh, a little bit surprising. We found that uh, when we plot sort of histograms of the leaves uh, that are star forming and the leaves that aren't star forming, uh, there are some interesting trends. So the black lines here represent the ratio of star forming leaves to non star forming leaves. Um, and we find that uh, in terms of the number density of the sources, so just this, essentially the, the three dimensional deprojected density of each source, uh, most 
we, we don't see any particular increase in the number of star forming leaves as you go to higher densities. Um, this is pretty counterintuitive since most sort of prescriptions for star formation say that if you go to a higher density, you should have a more uh, higher chance of collapsing and forming a star. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case for our sample of star forming cores, or uh, our sample of, of sort of compact uh, cores within the galactic center. However, if you consider instead the, uh, the over density, which in this case we define as the, the small scale column density measured by the uh, interferometer of the SMA, uh, divided by the larger scale column density derived from uh, Herschel dust emission, um, we find that there is a very, very strong relationship between this over density uh, and the uh, rate of star formation within these compact structures. So this is a signature that maybe uh, it's, it's less to do with the absolute density, uh, but more to do with the relationship between the amount of density contained within these compact structures uh, compared to their envelopes. Um, so perhaps another signature that the environment is import more important necessarily than just the absolute density of the gas. Um, I'll just gloss over this for now since I'm a little behind on time, but I, uh, one of the other goals of this is just to develop a cloud by cloud star formation rate for um, each cloud within the uh, CMZ. And using this, we hope to uh, sort of try to figure out uh, star formation as a function of position within uh, the central molecular zone. And the tentative results seem to show that uh, the star formation rate towards the, the edges of the, star, uh, of the central molecular zone appear to be higher than in the center. Uh, again, I'll come back to talk a little bit more about what this means in terms of the orbits and the structure of the CMZ when I talk more about the, the theoretical side of my work. Um, again, uh, a little bit of a teaser for future work. Uh, we're expanding this work to, to characterize the massive YSOs that we're detecting uh, using this catalog from CMZoom. Uh, we're expanding this to include some wavelengths from uh, the forecast instrument from SOFIA. Um, so I'm leading an archival uh, research uh, proposal that is going to look at uh, characterizing the dust spectral emission distributions from uh, each of these YSOs and trying to figure out what sort of evolutionary stage of star formation they're in, and then perhaps using that to try to figure out whether there are uh, evolving populations of stars that relate to orbits in the central molecular zone. Um, so this, this work is just preliminary now, but we're uh, hoping to continue uh, chugging away at this and get some interesting results. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about the uh, theoretical side of my work, uh, in particular the hydrodynamical simulations that I've been developing uh, with Ralph Klesson's group based in Heidelberg. Um, so all of the work I'm about to talk about has uh, been sort of co-advised by my advisor, Kara Battersby, but also by Ralph Klesson, and in particular by uh, Mattia Sormani and Robin Tress, who are um, also uh, working on this same theoretical model. So to understand a little bit more about what the CMZ is from a sort of face-on perspective, um, we can just consider what orbits can exist within a barred galactic center potential. Um, when we try to figure out exactly what the stable orbits are, it turns out there are two uh, families of stable orbits in uh, a barred central potential like the Milky Ways. Um, you have these outer orbits, which exist at larger galactosynic radii called X1 orbits. And then as you push in towards the galactic center, these X1 orbits become more and more elliptical. Uh, and actually they start to get kind of pinched at the edges. Um, and at a certain point, they become so pinched that they actually self-intersect with each other. Um, so the, the orbits are still closed, but the gas sort of goes along these um, uh, self-intersecting paths, which for stars is no problem. If you're collisionless, you can go on a self-intersecting orbit just fine. Um, but for, uh, for gas, you uh, have collisions, and those collisions uh, change the angular momentum of the gas, call, causing it to fall inwards. Uh, these streams of sort of uh, shocked gas as they fall inwards form structures that are known as the dust lanes. 
uh, those dust lanes then feed gas inwards towards the center of the galaxy where the second family of stable orbits live called the X2 orbits, which are these uh, elliptical orbits at the center uh, that kind of look like the pupil of an eye here. And those orbits uh, constitute this sort of 100 parsec ring that I was talking about earlier. Um, so this figure on the right here from Doll 2010 shows uh, what we think the galactic center might look like from the face on based on this orbital theory. Um, we think that these X2 orbits at larger radii feed gas inwards. Um, and then once they reach these self-intersecting orbits, you have structures like Banya's clump, uh, which represent these collision points. And then the gas falls inwards along structures known as the dust lanes uh, that feed the inner uh, sort of region of the galactic center, these X2 orbits uh, that we observationally know as the central molecular zone. So there's a number of dynamical mechanisms here that are particularly interesting to study. Uh, first of all, these collisions are extreme by pretty much any standards. Um, you have gas traveling at hundreds of kilometers per second, uh, colliding with gas moving at hundreds of, uh, hundreds of kilometers per second, moving the other way. Um, and so that is certainly an interesting environment to study gas dynamics and star formation and turbulence. Um, you have very, very intense shear. These orbits are moving quickly and they change rapidly as a function of galactic radius. Um, so in a lot of cases, you have gas that is uh, undergoing very extreme shear. Uh, there are cloud-cloud collisions happening in the galactic center, both with the inflow and also with other clouds in, uh, on those X2 orbits. Uh, again, there's a supermassive black hole at the center. So perhaps you have some tidal compression when uh, molecular clouds pass close to the galactic center. Um, and then lastly, uh, it's been suggested that there are uh, there, there could be intermediate mass black holes in this environment, which would be particularly interesting seeing as uh, there haven't been intermediate mass black holes uh, discovered. Uh, so it, it would be particularly interesting to find some, some of those uh, within our galactic center if they existed. I'm just gonna take a quick drink of water. Okay, so we have a whole slew of interesting dynamical mechanisms that we can study within this environment now that we sort of understand what it might look like. Unfortunately, we don't get a very nice face on view of the galactic center. Uh, this is sort of the curse of Milky Way astronomy is that everything's embedded in the disk. And so one of the key tools that we have to study the structure of our galaxy uh, are position velocity diagrams. So this top panel here shows uh, the longitude versus latitude on the y-axis. Um, and as you can see, the central molecular zone is just kind of a bunch of stuff, a big clump of stuff. Um, however, if we look at the uh, line of sight velocity as a function of galactic longitude as derived from some spectral line, in this case derived from carbon monoxide, um, suddenly there's a lot going on. Uh, we can see the signatures of a lot of these features that I was talking about on the previous slide. So um, you have this uh, large mess in the center, which has been labeled here as the, the parallelogram. Um, it's essentially just huge velocity dispersions because you have multiple gas clouds moving at very, very different velocities uh, along the same lines of sight. But you also do have very large velocity dispersions within each of those clouds. So actually, it is uh, just a very, very complex environment. And that's sort of what's typically called the CMZ. Um, although what that refers to here is that sort of uh, those X2 orbits within about 100 parsecs of the galactic center. Um, you also see these long kind of arching filaments in position velocity space. And these uh, we uh, very strongly suspect to be uh, signatures of the dust lanes. So the, that gas that gets its angular momentum killed by these collisions falls in towards the galactic center where it collides uh, with the X2 orbits. Um, and you can see there's one of those on the near side of the galaxy and one of them on the far side of the galaxy. There are also these features that have been noted for a couple decades in the position velocity diagram, uh, which were originally called uh, vertical features, although uh, we've sort of recoined them as extended velocity features since vertical 
we found just from a pedagogical standpoint was kind of throwing people off. There's nothing actually vertical in terms of position space about them. Uh, they appear vertical in the position velocity diagrams because they have large velocity dispersions contained within very, very small longitude ranges. Um, and so these features are somewhat mysterious. They have uh, velocity dispersions of upwards of 100, 150 kilometers per second uh, contained within a very, very narrow sort of spatial range. Um, so we'll come back to what these might be, but it's been suggested that those are signatures of intermediate mass black holes accreting. Um, uh, what I particularly want to draw attention to, I guess, in this diagram are these uh, dust lane features, because again, it's thought that that's how gas enters the galactic center. So if we want to study the rate of inflow to the galactic center, studying those dust lanes is critical. The inflow rate to the galactic center is actually a very important uh, quantity to measure in terms of understanding the evolution. Uh, so we kind of understand the galactic center at this point to be sort of a, a living, breathing ecosystem where you have gas flowing inwards, uh, which collapses and forms stars along those X2 orbits. Uh, those stars then explode and kick gas both out of the galaxy um, and inwards towards the sort of uh, circumnuclear disk, driving inflow onto the supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. That then drives AGN uh, outflows if it sort of the AGN at the galactic, or the, the black hole turns into an AGN, um, which is then very important for uh, influencing our galaxy and the uh, sort of extra galactic region that we live in. So this inflow rate actually feeds into all of these other mechanisms and we can't really constrain any of these mechanisms without having a good idea of the inflow rate. So uh, Sarmani and Barnes in 2019 published a paper uh, trying to figure out what that inflow rate is by looking at the position velocity diagram and saying, well, if these dust lanes are pushing gas inwards towards the galactic center, then we expect them to be um, uh, we expect them to be sort of feeding gas onto the galactic center uh, according to their velocity. So by using a sort of simple geometric model for those dust lanes, they were able to provide a forecast of the inflow onto the galactic center over uh, the next few mega years. Um, however, it was noted that not all of this gas necessarily accretes directly onto the galactic center. Some of it might overshoot, some of it might be sort of kicked out of its orbit. Um, so if we want to actually figure out what the true inflow rate of the galactic center is, we need to understand the efficiency of the inflow. We need to understand how much of this dust lane gas actually accretes onto the CMZ and how much of it um, is lost or accretes at a later time. Um, so I use this hydrodynamical model that we've been building to try to constrain that inflow rate or that inflow efficiency. Um, so I did this by running a simulation in uh, the Arepo framework. And uh, we implemented a, a very carefully constructed model of the Milky Way's uh, gravitational potential. Um, we're sort of constantly improving this model of the galactic pot potential to try to uh, most accurately as possible represent uh, the, the orbits and gas flows of the galactic center. Um, we chose to implement this without uh, star formation physics, so without gas self-gravity feed, uh, and feedback, because we wanted to really isolate uh, the potentials in just the gravitational potential of the galaxy and what that does to the gas. Um, we have also been running simulations that do include star formation and feedback um, and confirm that the inflow rate is actually similar in those cases, but um, just as like a sanity check to make sure that including star formation doesn't actually change the, uh, the, the rate of inflow. Uh, and these simulations are, are very successful at reproducing the position velocity diagram of the galactic center. Um, so we, we believe that at least from a structural standpoint, these are doing a pretty good job of recreating a sort of realistic galactic center, at least in terms of the gas flows. Um, so here's a comparison between the simulated and real uh, galactic center in terms of position velocity space. On the left is the simulation, and on the right is the uh, observational uh, position velocity diagram. And you can see that a lot of the features are quite similar. You have these large arching features that we think are the dust lanes, and in the simulation, we can confirm that those are in fact the dust lanes. Um, we have the messy high velocity dispersion sort of parallelogram of the CMZ. 
Um, but strangely enough, we also have these very, very high velocity dispersion uh, extended velocity features, or as they were previously called, vertical features. It should be noted that we didn't actually include uh, supermassive black or intermediate mass black hole physics in these. Um, so clearly, there must be another explanation. Um, we show that these uh, large velocity dispersion features are actually coming from the collision points where gas uh, is either colliding with the galactic center, uh, with, with the, um, the X2 orbits, or where gas that overshoots from one of the dust lane uh, collides with the other dust lane moving at hundreds of kilometers per second the other direction. And so you end up with these very, very high velocity dispersion collision points. Um, so there's no actual signature for intermediate mass black holes, as exciting as it would be to, to have such a signature. Um, this is all just coming from the dynamics of the galactic center. Um, so the way that I measured the inflow rate was using uh, uh, Monte Carlo tracer particles. Um, in a repo, there is no uh, simple way uh, to follow individual mass elements through simulation time because it is a moving mesh um, sort of algorithm. And we uh, found that including uh, tracer particles as essentially these massless um, particles that just kind of invect with the uh, mass transfer between each time step, we were able to trace the flow of the mass without actually affecting the simulation. We just sort of inject uh, tracer particles, which act kind of like confetti in a river, where you sort of just throw them into the flow of the gas, and they flow uh, with the dust lanes. Uh, and we're able to trace them over time. So by injecting the tracer particles in, we measure uh, the rate at which those tracer particles accrete onto the galactic center and are able to estimate in accretion efficiency. Um, so here's just a little uh, gallery of the uh, way in which this happens. You have some sample of tracers in the dust lane, some fraction of those tracers overshoot the galactic center, um, and some fraction of them accrete on. And using this, uh, by taking a whole bunch of these measurements, uh, we find that we have sort of an average inflow efficiency of about 30%. Um, from that, we estimate the inflow rate towards the galactic center using uh, the, the actual measurements of the dust lanes within the real uh, central molecular zone. And we find that the inflow rate towards the galactic center is about 0.8 uh, solar masses per year. Uh, like I said before, we double check this in a few other ways, um, both by checking with the simulations that include more realistic ISM physics like uh, self-gravity and star formation, uh, but also by just testing this accretion rate in a couple other ways. Uh, uh, since I'm running low on time, I'm just gonna skip over that, but rest assured we, we, we tested uh, this inflow rate in a, a few different ways and confirmed that it all comes out to be about one third of the particle, or about one third of the material in the dust lane accretes on its first pass, and about two thirds of it accretes at a later time, or maybe even doesn't accrete. Um, we were also able, as sort of a, a bonus to this, to uh, use those same tracer particles to follow clouds within the simulation. Um, so by injecting clouds into, or sorry, injecting tracer particles into particular clouds, we were able to follow them in time and uh, sort of see how they evolve. Again, we didn't want to be too, um, we didn't want to try to claim too much about the properties of these clouds, because again, these are uh, somewhat low physics runs. We're not including gas self-gravity or star formation or feedback. So we're uh, not trying to study, you know, the star formation rates of these clouds, obviously, or anything like that. We just sort of wanted to see uh, what we could say about them within this low physics run that is, uh, since everything within this run is dominated by the large scale gravitational potential. Um, so here's just a, a little video of these clouds going, uh, one of these clouds going on its orbit around the galactic center. And you can see that it kind of fragments into other clouds, which then uh, collide with each other and uh, refragment later on. And uh, there's sort of collisions with the inflowing material uh, that occurs at the epicenter of the cloud's orbit. Uh, and I'll specify particularly it happens at the epicenter because that ends up being a little bit important. Um, we are able to study uh, the the average density of these clouds, and when we just look at where uh, look at what happens to the density of these clouds as a function of their orbit, 
um, we find that the clouds undergo density compressions when they collide with uh, the inflow at the apocenter of the orbits. So as these clouds pass by uh, the, their apocenter, uh, material crashes into them, and there is a compression of, of the clouds at those points. Um, this is particularly interesting because some previous studies have suggested that there should be um, a sort of tidal compression of the clouds as they pass the paracenter of their orbits. Um, and we do see some uh, density maxima occurring at the paracenter of those orbits, but it seems like the, uh, the dominant thing compressing these clouds are these collisions that happen at the apocenters of the orbits. Uh, another interesting feature that happens at the apocenter has to do with the, the cloud rotation. Uh, again, there's some missing physics here, but uh, just looking at the rotation that is created by the uh, dynamical potential, we find that uh, clouds in the galactic center tend to typically uh, counter rotate. And this is, this is a, a well-known result. Um, it's been shown both observationally, like from these uh, ALMA observations from Federath et al. 2016, um, but also from a, uh, in past theoretical studies that the, the intense shear in the galactic center should drive clouds to uh, counter rotate relative to their orbit. Uh, however, we actually find that some of our clouds are co-rotating and it's a small fraction, only about 7% of the clouds uh, are co-rotating, uh, but there wasn't really a, a previous explanation for why there sh should ever be uh, co-rotating clouds in the galactic center. And when we consider where these clouds occur, it seems that they always occur immediately after apocenter passage. So it seems like what's happening here, sort of from a phenomenological standpoint, is that the clouds are going through their orbits, they pass by the apocenter of the orbit, uh, they get collided with by this high velocity gas from the dust lanes, which changes their angular momentum and compresses them. Uh, this is potentially interesting given that the one of the most intense sites of star formation in the galaxy appears to be near the apocenter of its orbit. Um, so it's unclear exactly whether the apocenter orbit is, is uh, interfering with the star formation or perhaps if it's triggering an increase in star formation or driving some sort of turbulence which suppresses star formation later in the orbit. Um, so for future work here, I don't have much time to talk about it, but uh, we're planning on expanding the sort of high physics versions of these simulations in which we include uh, star formation, gas, self-gravity, and feedback within our, our sort of carefully constructed uh, gravitational model of the galactic center. Um, so uh, in uh, previous work, we had done this uh, using, uh, uh, again, using a repo. Uh, but in the future, we hope to run uh, zoom simulations on uh, these sort of high physics runs in which we define regions using tracer particles and then uh, zoom in to much, much higher resolution, hopefully resolving things like the uh, core mass function uh, and the sort of uh, smaller scales of turbulence that might be suppressing the formation of compact substructures. Um, so in the future, we're hoping to expand our analysis uh, by sort of pushing to, to higher and higher resolutions and including more and more physics in these simulations. Uh, and the goal is to compare with uh, a, uh, a lot of ALMA data that is, is coming up on the horizon that we'll have access to. Okay, so that uh, about brings me to the end of the talk. I know I sort of ran out of time there, um, but I would be happy to uh, take any questions. Great, thank you, Perry. Um, and we definitely have plenty of time for questions. Do have any? Uh, let's see, Mike, you have a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, as I understand it, your simulation setup, uh, it's got gas with no self-gravity moving around in a like, rotating stellar bar. Um, and I was just wondering how long lived uh, we actually expect that bar structure to be and to what extent the simulations are premised on uh, on assumptions about that that persistence of the bar? That's a good question. Um, and this is uh, something that I'm really interested in exploring in the future. Um, the the bar potential that we use here, we just assume it to be long lasting relative to the orbits that we're looking at. So uh, the simulation that I used for this work um, 
it it takes some time to sort of uh, uh, mature because we need to run it uh, with the bar initially turned off and then slowly turn on the barred potential because otherwise you get um, unrealistic shocks within the gas just from changing the potential suddenly. Um, but the actual sort of mature period of the run uh, is about, uh, oh gosh, what is it? I think it's about uh, 50 mega years long. And um, to that purpose, we assume that the bar survives for 50 mega years in a roughly consistent form. Um, I know that there's a, a long literature of, of how long lived certain bars are and how some bars may be rather short lived. Um, but how this all relates to kind of galactic evolution is something that we haven't looked into yet. Uh, but I certainly think it would be interesting to look into. That's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Uh, I wanted to, oh, um, Enrique, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, not sure if this makes a lot of sense, Barry, because I'm not at all in the area. Very nice talk, by the way. But does, uh, do you know if the composition of the gas makes any difference? Uh, when you plot at the scale, let us say that our galaxy is a little bit below the expected star formation rates. Uh, do you have any information about composition if you know if that makes any difference? Yes, that. Um, or I think actually you may have been referring to a similar one that I had a little, this one. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I would suspect that it does. Um, sorry, can you, can you clarify a little bit what you mean by composition? So these are different galaxies, right? So I'm guessing composition in this uh, type of molecular gas is traced by oxygen, uh, if it's high metallicity, low metallicity. So I was wondering if that makes a difference in the star formation, how much of a difference that makes in star formation rate, and if that can in some way help explain this difference in the Milky Way. Um, I am I am not sure. I know that there are a lot of uncertainties with regard to the metallicity of gas within the galactic center. Um, it's a hard environment to study in, in terms of the properties of gas like that. But um, I would suspect that it, it does have an influence. And I think um, the sort of higher physics simulations that we're running might be a way to explore that further um, since we're, we're using a... Um, a sort of live chemical network that traces um, carbon and, and oxygen uh, physics, uh, mostly with the, the goal of studying uh, the sort of evolution of CO. Um, but I think you could also use it to study metallicity potentially in the, in, in the future, um, which could be quite interesting. But I, I don't actually know necessarily how that would affect uh, the overall star formation rate of the galactic center. Yeah, I was thinking more in the lines of does a higher molecular rate of the gas or lower helps the cloud should collapse into stars or not? It's just a, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. It, 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 it could affect uh, the thermal properties of the gas, so making cooling more efficient and stuff like that. But I, um, uh, I don't have a sense of intuition for how that would change the rate at which the clouds would fragment. OK, thanks. Thanks for indulging my. Oh, yeah, no worries. Thank you. My curiosity. Any more questions? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, so in that case, let's uh, thank Perry again for a really nice talk, very interesting. And thanks everyone else for joining us today. Thanks, thanks everyone. Really good. Thanks, thanks very you. much. Thank you.